writing down all of the bad stuff that's happened where I'm frustrated and it's negative and you sometimes just have to get it out. It's very much like food poisoning and we have to get it out to be able to move on. And what I'll do is I'll write, 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 rip the page out, rip it up. It's over, throw it away. Now what am I creating from here? That's been a good practice and that's something I haven't shared before, George. Welcome to your intended message, the perfect place for leaders and promising professionals who want to convey the intended message for greater success. Every week, we interview experts who address the challenges and best practices to deliver your message effectively. That might be one-to-one, -one, one to few, or one to many. And perhaps the most important conversation, one to self. I'm your host, George Torok. My guest today is Jason Hewlett. Here's three facts I believe you should know about Jason. He was one of the youngest inductees into the National Speakers Association Speaker Hall of Fame at age 37, one of the youngest. Two, Jason posted on Facebook about seeing his wife at the store. And that particular post went viral and it's been seen, viewed more than 150 million views. That's 150 million views. And you know, and I'm happy if, if I get 10 views of my posts. So Jason certainly touched a nerve there. And the third fact you should know is he, at the beginning of his career, when he aspired to be a Las Vegas entertainer, he turned down a job offer, an offer with, with all the money and, and coaching provided. He was offered to headline his own show on Las Vegas, on the Las Vegas Strip in the casino, and he turned it down. Gee, we're going to have to find out why. And Jason, Jason, welcome to your intended message. Thank you, George. What a great introduction. Jason, delighted to be talking to you. Uh, you're all the way from Salt Lake City, Utah. It's, it's great to reach out across the country, across the world. Now, I'm curious, and I'm sur sure some of our listeners are curious. You had your dream of becoming a Las Vegas star. You were an entertainer, a dancer, a singer, and you had the offer that you wanted, and you turned it down. Why was that? Well, George, I think that when we begin our careers, we have aspirations and dreams to do something great. My dream aspiration was the Las Vegas headliner show. And my wife and I, after three years of doing the performing and so forth, she and I went to Las Vegas for an offer. We didn't realize it was going to be this offer. We thought it was just, you know, come be a part of one of our shows and we'll kind of coach you along. But it was really this offer of, we're going to take over your career. We're going to tell you what you get to do, what you get to perform. All the producers were there of the other shows that we had seen that were fascinating and wonderful, but they didn't necessarily align with my values. And I established my career with the intention of being a performer, entertainer that families could enjoy together. Grandparents wouldn't have to be embarrassed when the performer said something that was you know, embarrassing to the grandchildren. And so I decided to do a family friendly performance. Unfortunately, my values didn't align with the intention of the casinos. The casinos wanted to embrace the new theme of Vegas at the time, which was what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So things were a little bit more uh, adult, if you will. And we could not come to a compromise, despite the fact that they thought I was the next great performer that would be a headliner in Vegas, and they were going to take over my career. But we walked away from that opportunity, and it, it may sound like a, I'm just saying it was a simple choice. It really was not. It was, uh, it was a game changer for me, because then I was blacklisted from the city from doing a headlining show there ever again. And I then turned my sights on be, being a performer and speaker for corporate events, which wanted family-friendly entertainment and wanted something that was appropriate for all ages. And so that's become my career and that is the story. Now, I find that fascinating because what you thought was your dream and what you worked for when it was handed to you, 
you, it wasn't quite what you thought it would be. And now you had to make this, which I, I'm guessing was a difficult decision because here's a chance to, here's the chance to be the star, big money, big fame. All you got to do is maybe tell some dirty jokes or something like that. Who knows what kind of things, but it didn't mesh with your values. I'm, I'm guessing it wasn't an instant decision. Did you, you and your wife talk this over for some time? Oh, certainly. I mean, at the time, I was just living gig to gig as a performer hoping to get the next opportunity. And so when all of a sudden you have your future lined out ahead of you, it's quite the experience to say, wow, they like me enough. They think and believe in me enough that I could be this guy. That was a huge coup for us. And then equally to say to ourselves, what do we stand for? What do we want our legacy to be? Someday we'll have children, we said way back then. What is going to be the thing that they'll know us for? And are we able to live our principles, our values, the foundation that we've created and keep a promise to ourselves? Because George, I made a promise years earlier that it would always be a family friendly experience. And you know, we can certainly change as we go. And I get that. And I have other peers that have accepted those types of huge offers and I've watched their lives. And I'll be candid with you. I'm grateful I made the choice I did. It would be very hard to speak, I think, about the power of keeping a promise to ourselves if I hadn't made that choice. Now, speaking of promise, your book is called The Promise to the One. Who or what is the one and why is that significant? So, yeah, the book, let me grab it right here. Uh, the book it has, a, has a pretty mountain on the f cover, so it's kind of easy to find when you're at the Amazon store. But the promise to the one, a lot of people go, what is the one? Is it your boss? Is it the company you work for? Is it your customer? The one is you. The one is yourself. So what's your promise that you've made to yourself and what potentially have you maybe broken in those promises throughout your life? That's what this book asks. And it's really a practice and a read of discovering what makes you happy and what is your true purpose in life. And what are some of the promises that you made when you were young that maybe you've forgotten? As well as what are some of the opportunities that are coming your way that maybe you need to turn away and keep a promise to self, even if it means, yes, the opportunity is great. You might make millions of dollars or a, a way better living. Whereas in my case, you know, we've gone through life where I've even had years that were so down, I've had to cash out the 401k just to survive. My life would have been way different had I signed the Vegas contract. So it's not to say that a promise makes everything perfect, but rather it makes everything peaceful because our harmony is our integrity and promises are a very important part of our lives. Now, Jason, is, is the implication, it, it says the promise, is the implication here that there is one promise to yourself that is more relevant than all the other promises? Because we promise ourselves all kinds of things. You know, I'm going to lose weight. Yes, so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll clean out that closet or, or uh, you, 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 all these little promises that we make to ourselves, we make to others. Is there one key promise that stands above all the others? Great question. I don't think so. I think that it's in the matter of little promises, big promises. I mean, we could talk semantics all day between a goal and a promise, commitments, etc. But I do like to lean into the concept of why set a goal when we can make a promise. And that's not to say that a goal isn't important, because of course they are. I've lived goals my whole life and they've helped me accomplish a lot. But when, when, we, when we have goals and we miss them, we just set a new goal. There's no ramification. Whereas with the promise, if you make it and break it, you have a problem. And so really a, a promise is a sacred goal. It's something you are absolutely going to do. So whatever the promise is to yourself, maybe it is to lose weight. Uh, that could be a good goal that you could say, I'm going to set some goals, some particulars to get me to my promise, which is I just want to feel healthier. Maybe that's the great promise proclamation. And that's why I say goals are particulars where promises are proclamations. So what are your proclamations and your, your true promises to yourself? So this is a case of one having some really uh, vital conversations with oneself about, about where one is and where one, one, one wants to go in, in life, I, I imagine. 
and and it sounds like you you've had this conversation at least at least once if not more than once yeah it's certainly a conversation with self in the very beginning of the book i teach the power of journaling and why writing in a journal is so essential to our self-assessment including keeping those promises because nietzsche said that the problem with setting a pro or making a promise is that you forget what you promised yourself <laughs> and so how are we remembering that maybe it's through journaling maybe it's through the exercises in the book that take you through this process of asking yourself am i really living a life of integrity am i finding what my true character is do i know what level of kindness i'm willing to share with the world or service there's the chapters are just uh, very simple chapters self-acceptance habits calling those types of things and then it's just expounds on that with autobiographical stories of mine plus then exercises that you can go through and really expand your mind and your horizons and fill your soul with the peace that you want to keep your promises you mentioned journaling and by journaling do you mean every day one should write something down or, or roughly you could if you look behind me here i have a th those are all journals back there uh, I, I do have journals for just writing down what happened the last day or the last week. I have journals of creativity only. I have journals of a spiritual nature where I might read a spiritual book and then write what I learned there or hear a spiritual talk. I mean, there's all kinds of journals that you could do. Uh, I do like the concept of trying to journal on a daily basis, but that's very difficult. And so even if you just did once a week, say on a Sunday, you know, when we're all kind of sitting there ready for the new week to begin, maybe just jot down what happened the last week as a history, and then start to really write the affirmations and your intentions for the coming week. You can create your entire life through what you write down. And as we know, you know, if we don't write down a, a goal, it becomes just a dream that's forgotten. And so that's where the intentionality of writing in the journal is a game changer. When you approach your journal or when you, when you, in the early days, when you started journaling, did you at times have apprehension of, Oh, I don't know if I should write this down because I'm, <laughs> it, it's not good news. Oh yeah, for sure. And that's, what's fun about a journal. I know when I was a kid, I didn't share as much because I didn't know if family was going to come read it. But I know now that my wife knows it's a sacred place. My kids know as well, but equally I also have, a space reserved for writing down all of the bad stuff that's happened where I'm frustrated and it's negative and you sometimes just have to get it out. It's very much like food poisoning and we have to get it out to be able to move on. And what I'll do is I'll write, 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 rip the page out, rip it up. It's over, throw it away. Now, what am I creating from here? That's been a good practice. And that's something I haven't shared before, George. Now that's interesting. Uh, you rip it up because what you wrote down, you wrote in anger or? It serves no more purpose once it's out, you know, unless, unless there's really a huge lesson that needs to be taught within it that someday I'll read again or somebody that will read it will find. I'm just writing and writing and writing and then I say, is this something that will serve anyone in the future? And I know for myself when I look back at it and I go, this is, this is just plain ugliness. This is a get the poison out, let's get rid of it, throw it away, move forward. So you'll open a journal of mine and you'll see missing pages and be like, whoa, I wonder what happened that day. <laughs> do, do you read your journal? Do you? Oh yeah, yeah, I, I'll go back even when I'm opening it up like this morning, opened it up, looked back over a couple pages, even looked back a year ago or went to another journal, checked that, you know, check that out, see where you're at. And that really helps you to see what kind of promises you're making or breaking. For example, in your finances or in your health or in the way that you're thinking, the way that you wake up, what's your morning routine. If I have the same morning routine every single morning and I am not improving in some ways through the years, how do I need to change that? So as I, as I self-assess, then I go through and say, oh, that makes sense. I need to shift that behavior, whether it's opening the phone and reading the news each day to start your day rather than not opening the phone at all and just going for a jog, you know? So that's how we can shift that behavior. And when, when you write in your, your journal, 
Is it full sentences or is it is it point form? Because I found that sometimes when I, I write things that are just point form and and other people can't understand it. <laughs> yeah. Well, really, the journal is just for you. And, and so I write it as as free form as I want with my long sentences. And then I'll bullet point the things that I'm going to go attack or that are bothering me and then the solution. So it's really just like a blank canvas that you can create anything you want out of it. So it sounds like your journal becomes your, your psychiatrist couch. <laughs> That's right. And it's a really good one, you know, because you, you get to assess yourself, see what's happening, and then I will go and I'll talk to my wife about it or my, my coach or mentor, other people, and I say, hey, I had this thought this morning, I was writing in my journal, what do you think of this? And they'll say, ooh, I think that's a great idea, or no, that gets you off track from your dreams and goals. So what are some of the promises that you can make that are better for yourself? And that's what the journal helps me assess. Taking the concept of journaling and just extending it a little bit, uh, let's, let's look at that Facebook post you wrote. It, it looks like when you wrote that, it was looked like you were journaling because you you look you weren't really writing it for anyone else. You were just writing your thoughts. Let me see. It started out with uh, this is not a typical Facebook post. Starts out uh, kind of embarrassed to admit this, but I think I sort of cheated on my wife today. <laughs> Now, that's a catchy sentence. No wonder it caught attention. But what really happened was, tell us. Yeah, I, I was just writing this thing that happened, this story that I thought was funny, as if no one was going to read it. I knew a couple of people would see it, but I posted it very late at night. And I had uh, gone to Target before I was going on a trip. Target is a big store in the U.S. And I, and I, I went to the store by myself to get some manly things, some beard trimmer, some some beef jerky, some sardines. I'm throwing it in the cart and I rushed to the f closest line that had only two people in it. So the line with two people, there was a brunette and a blonde and I looked up and went, whoa. And, and then I realized it was my wife. <laughs> so in that split second, I didn't realize that she was at the store. She had come independent of my trip. And so I, I talked about how I felt like in an instant, I cheated on my wife because I saw this beautiful blonde and went, whoa, who's that beautiful woman? And then realized, oh, that's my wife. And so this whole post became a thing where across the entire world, it was the top trending story online. Even the, the day that the Kardashians had babies, like crazy stuff. I was the top trending name for about 48 hours in the whole world about this post because people read it thinking I was actually cheating, which they love that as a hook. And then it turns into a love story about seeing the person we love, uh, somebody that we see all the time, as if it were with fresh eyes and to be grateful for the light that they are in our lives. And it became a beautiful love story and really became something that people would say, that's a man who's keeping a promise to his wife and what a great story we get to read this, because usually it's not that good of news, you know, when somebody says, I cheated. So it was a fun, nice story. Yes, yeah, a very positive story. And uh, clearly you are a romantic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was certainly the long form writing. It's funny, if you go on Facebook and you go to my Jason Hewlett page, you'll see that that's the top pinned post still after almost almost five years now since that happened. And there are all these women that write, you got to read this. And then they tag their boyfriend or their husband. And every guy either writes, this is too long to read, or this is disgusting. I hate it. <laughs> and so it's very funny. Jason, you let's talk about what happened to you after you turned down that, that Las Vegas uh, headline show. You went in a different direction with your talent, your, your talents, your skills. You're, you're, uh, you're an entertainer. You're a dancer. You do weird things with your face. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you know, Jim Carrey would be jealous of, of the rubber things you do with your lips. Um, I, I watched you do that, and I thought, that, that is weird. That is strange. And you, um, uh, you referred to it as a gift, your gift, and you share that with the world. But what's the message that you've been taking to the corporate world with all these goofy moves? Well, 
for the listeners only, they're going to want to watch the video of this because yes, as a kid, I found out I could do funny things with my face and that my face was able to manipulate and, and move around and my nose and my lips and everything. And that has been a great teaching tool because it's such a weird thing that I can do. It's so out of the ordinary. It kind of makes no sense why someone would practice that or share it outside of being 10 years old. And so as a kid finding out I could do these things, I realized this became a teaching tool to be able to say to a corporate executive and those that I coach, especially when I say to them, are you sharing your gifts from your childhood? That which makes you who you really are. And then they reveal to me that they put the art pen or pencil down years ago, or they put the paints away. They stopped doing their poetry. They, they don't write music anymore. I mean, you go through the, the, the library of the life and the skill set of so many great leaders. And because of their job, they've had to put on this persona, which makes sense. And they feel that they're keeping their promise to their corporation or to their team and their people that they lead, where in reality, there's so much more tucked away back in those shelves and those drawers that they could share that would make them have a, perhaps a bit more humanity or vulnerability, authenticity. Maybe it is the ability to spread joy. Maybe it's the ability to solve more problems and we aren't uh, courageous enough to share it. And so that's why using my face as I say, look, these are my gifts and you have talents that I don't have and I have talents you don't want. So share what you've got. It's your gift with the world. And if you don't share it, you're cheating the world of that which only you can do. And it really knocks people out. They've never thought of it that way. But to see someone like me, who is a Las Vegas entertainer, now a Hall of Fame speaker, sharing these goofy faces or the things that I can do, and they say, how could you have so much courage to do that? And I say, I hope mine sharing it gives you courage to share yours. The tagline I saw with your book says, become a legendary leader and discover your signature moves. What's the meaning of that line? Because it sounds like there's a lot in there. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Legendary leaders really just means we're all legendary if we choose to be. And others will say that's his signature move. That's what makes him unique. It's the, it's the moonwalk of the dancer. It's the ability to have, if, if you're a company like Apple, for example, their signature move is simplicity in technology. I mean, everybody knows what the signature moves are of others or companies we love. What's our personal branded signature moves that makes us unique? And it's how we become a legendary leader. People love us for it when we share it. Now, Jason, can you give us an example of one or two of people who have listened to you talk about helping them discover their and sharing their signature moves. Can you give us an example of, of signature moves people have used that that's made their life, their career better? Oh, certainly. That's, that's a great question. I've had people email me and say, my goodness, after I heard you speak, I got up from the table. I went over to my boss and the executives and I told them that I was addicted to drugs and I have been for 25 years and I am putting myself in rehab. Would they please support me in that? And you wouldn't believe the kind of responses I'm getting with this book because people are now keeping promises to themselves rather than just suffering through another day of work, instead checking into rehab to fix their life. And to get the email response after something like that, you know, six months later and saying, I'm clean, I'm good. I'm back at the company. I've never been more respected. They, they put me in a leadership position. That kind of thing is where it really, really works. And I go, oh, I'm so grateful that the message touched them in that way. Because it's not going to touch everyone that way. There's also been speakers that I've spoken with. For example, one lady, I was talking to her about her great storytelling ability. And I said, are there any hidden talents that you haven't used with all of your great stories? And she said, well, I, I have to admit, I grew up a classical pianist. And 
I, once I got married and then I had kids, I just stopped playing. I haven't played a piano in 15, 20 years. My husband doesn't know I play. My kids don't know I play. And I said, you're a classical pianist and your kids don't know? No. And so she went and uh, made a promise to share it with her family. And you can imagine that moment. I mean, imagine your mom sitting down and all of a sudden playing some beautiful piano piece. You're like, what the heck? When did you learn this? Now she goes to every speech and shares that gift, not just as a beautiful storyteller, but then she requests the piano and plays and the crowd goes crazy. This is where this message really helps to get people to step out onto that ledge of saying, I need to share that promise that I created a long time ago or that I need to keep to myself. And it really changes lives. It's a beautiful thing. How does, now, not everyone has the opportunity to have a conversation with, with Jason Hewlett and, and have Jason pose that question, question of, uh, okay, what's that signature move? What's that promise that you've broken that you haven't kept? So how does a person, how do they look into themselves and say, what, I, what am I suppressing? What promise am I breaking every day? How do they find that? Well, within the book, chapter two is the ICM process. And that's the way that we discover our signature moves. I stands for identify, C for clarify, M for magnify. So ICM process. And with the ICM process, really you're just identifying your gifts that you think are what your talents might be. And then you're creating your top 10 list. I try to encourage people to come up with 100 gifts that they have. And that's very hard to even get to 10. <laughs> if I were to say, hey, write down 10 things you can improve, people are like, I got 20. But if I say, write down 10 things you're good at, they're like, I can't think of one. That's how we think. And so it's a matter of saying, how can we get out of our own heads and go into our heart and say, I know I've got this great, this great talent, these gifts. And if I were to say, I'm an entertainer, I can then unpack that word to create from entertainment only. That means I'm creative. That means I'm restless. That means I'm relentless. I'm courageous. There's all kinds of things that come out of entertainer. And, uh, and that's what's cool about the process. That's identify. The next one with clarify is where you involve other people. So you put your identify top 10 list to the side that you identify with. And now you're asking your peers, your trusted advisors, your spouse or partner, the people you love and who love you. And it's not an exercise of saying, hey, tell me what I need to improve. That's another time and place. This is a part where you say, I need your help to discover what you feel are my signature traits, my signature moves. What makes me who I am? And I'll tell you, George, what's cool is that if I write the word, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the entertainer, someone will give me the word just voluntarily, I'm highly entertaining. Or if I say I'm funny, they clarify the word is hilarious. And so there's, there's something really powerful about getting those words that are even better words where I wrote down, I'm a, I'm a hard worker. They wrote down, I'm resilient. I mean, I like those words better. And so then you come up with a list of your own identify and then the list that others give you of clarify and you put those together, that becomes your signature moves. Those are now the words that you can hang your hat on. And now we magnify the promise. So identify, clarify, magnify, magnify, share it, leverage it, use it, own it, own what makes you unique in the eyes of others. And you will amplify your ability to sell, your ability to write, to create, to live, just leads to a happier life. It's interesting, Jason, while you're talking and you're describing that process and, and you talked about the, the, the signature moves and I can't help but thinking, you know, you know I'm thinking about myself naturally, like everybody, everybody in the audience at any one time, I'll, well, what does this mean to me? I don't care about you. And I'm thinking about uh, Georgie Porgy here and I'm thinking, well, you know, one of my signature moves or one is um, 
is conducting interviews. I hosted a radio show, an interview show for 19 years, and then I stopped, ended it six years ago. And only this year, I started this podcast to leverage my my joy and my skills of interviewing. And, and of course, there, what I discovered is there are multiple skills in there because there's listening, there's, uh, there's asking good questions, there's uh, realizing that you don't have to be the center of the show. Interesting insights. You just gave me some uh, wonderful insights for myself. And that's what a good speaker should do. Uh, people <laughs> should walk away from your presentation. They might be thinking, wow, that guy does weird stuff, but you want them going away thinking what? Exactly what you just said. I want them to think, how do I apply this into my life? How have I been using it? Or what am I scared of? What's the problem? Or even if I have a 20 year career in interviews and broadcasts, why am I not doing it every day? Because I absolutely love it. I mean, George, you are great at this. And if, if you absolutely hated it, then I would understand why you don't do it. But if you really love it and you're really great at it, then do it as much as you can because it blesses the world when you share your gifts. Wow, it blesses the world when you share your gifts. That's a positive message. And I think that's an apt place for us to, to wrap up. Jason, one last question before we do close. I'll remind people to find more information about Jason. You go to the website. Jason, Jason Hewlett.com. Hewlett is H E W L E T T.com. And you can find out more information about Jason there and be sure to check out his book, The Promise to the One on Amazon. Jason, the last question to you, and there's the cover for those watching the video. The question to you, Jason, is if you had only one message to deliver to the world, what would that be? Oh, it is the message of promise and keeping our promise that we were sent here to this earth, I believe, to discover in ourselves that we have so many gifts, that we are meant to do something great. It's our calling. It's our purpose. And when we discover it and when we share it, we make the world a greater place. And I like to close my keynotes with, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Because we all make it a wonderful world when we share our voice. That's our promise. If you like what you heard, remember to like, comment, and share this podcast. Come back every week for more practical insights to help you deliver your intended message. I'm your host, George Torok.